to you. Thank you. Um, I've got, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk on how to build a social network uh, with serverless technology. So my name is Yan Chui. I've actually been working with AWS uh, for a long time now. I've been running production workloads with AWS since about 2009. And as of last year, AWS also made me one of their serverless heroes because I produce a lot of content, uh, both blog posts, video courses, and so on. Um, and right now, I'm spending some of my time working with Lumigo as a developer advocate, and Lumigo is a company that's building a very powerful troubleshooting platform for service applications, especially when you're doing lots of async stuff. When you've got lots of messages flying around, it becomes much difficult to track them to understand the health of individual user transactions. So Lumigo is doing that, and some of my time also goes towards uh, consulting, where I work myself as an independent consultant, where I help various different companies around the world to adopt serverless technology successfully. Um, so nowadays I have what you may call a portfolio career where I do lots of different things, which is, I think is actually quite interesting. Uh, but before all of that, in 2016, I worked for a social network in London called Yubble, where we were trying to build something that's a mix of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And it was there that me and my team learned a lot about what it takes to really run a serverless application in production at scale with lots of complexities and so on. And when I joined the company, this is Yabo, uh, in 2016, in April, I inherited a pretty standard monolithic application where you've got a couple of EC2 clusters doing different things. There are some event-driven stuff happening already via the cloud AMQP. And in a few months' time, with a very small team of five engineers, uh, we migrated to entirely service architecture, where Lambda is a centerpiece that glued everything together. And before you do any big architecture rework, I think a good question to start with is uh, why, because rewrites are really going to pay themselves off. And in terms of, for us, why do we want to take this big rewrite and this whole paradigm shift? Well, when we consider that Yabo is an early age startup, uh, it's a small social network with about a million people on the platform. We already had some influencers from other platforms join us. Emily, for example, was one of our top users, and she had about 50,000 followers at the time when the whole platform had about a million users. And like Emily, many of these influencers would run campaigns on our platform where Emily would say, hey guys, vote on this post. And at 10 o'clock, I'm going to announce the lucky winner for this designer handbag. So as you can imagine, always throughout the day, our traffic is nice and stable. It's very low. And then exactly 10 o'clock, we get this massive spike in traffic because everybody's come in to see whether or not they want Emily's uh, uh, designer handbag, which makes my job as a backend engineer really difficult in terms of how to provision my cluster to cater for all these unpredictable spikes all the way throughout the day, sometimes you know, 70 to 100x of my normal traffic. So that means uh, I have to run my EC2 cluster at a very low utilization, much lower than I would like, and also because EC2 scaling takes a bit of time, so to cater for some of these spikes, I also want to be able to scale up a lot faster as well. And when you put the two things together, it means that we're spending a lot of money to on AWS for resources that we are just not using. By my estimate, we were probably using about 5% of what we pay for, which is horrendous when you consider that 95% of our AWS bill is just going to waste. And deployment was taking 30 minutes and requires downtime. The whole app has to go down and back up every time we do a deployment to production, which is just not good enough. And features were taking months to de develop as well. And one of my favorite speakers, uh, Dan North, once said that the lead time to someone saying thank you for the value that, that you're giving is the only reputational metric that matters to us as engineers. But as engineers, until our code is actually running production, as far as our users are concerned, we haven't done anything at all. So in terms of the why do we go through this journey to towards serverless, well, first and foremost, we just want to deliver a better user experience for our users, and also we want to, as a team, to deliver value to the business and to the users, again, faster. And as a company, we also want to be more cost efficient in terms of how much money we're spending. I'm all for spending money on something that delivers a lot of value, but I'm not happy when we're spending lots of money that just goes to waste. In terms of how do we do that, well, we have to first decide that what a good architecture would actually look like for us as a team, and we sat down and decided we want an architecture where deployments can be slow, fast, no downtime, and there's no lockstep deployment with the mobile app and the client and the web app as well. 
And we want features to be loosely coupled and uh, independently deployable. And as overall, we want to spend less money on resources that we don't use. It's not so much as pay, spending less, but spending smarter, spending better, more efficiently. And we also want to minimize the amount of operational overhead that we have to carry as a team. And we also need to address all these technical issues that we have inherited from the current architecture. But whilst we do that, we also don't want to take time out and not deliver anything. If anything, we actually want to deliver value to our customers faster than we've ever done before. So in terms of the direction, we decided that we should go towards an approach where we are going moving towards microservices using our event-driven uh, architectures, and we want to use the serverless as the primary technology that we use to build this new platform with. The what is, uh, at least some of the what is what, what I'm gonna talk about in this particular talk. And if that circle looks familiar, uh, you should, uh, you've probably seen it from the, uh, the Golden Circle by Simon Sinek from his book, uh, Start With Why. If you haven't read it, you should definitely read it. It's very, very insightful. So by the time we finished a lot of this rework, this re-architecture, we had about 200 Lambda function, give or take, uh, running in production. And at that time, even though cost wasn't our primary driver for doing any of this work, we did find a very healthy dose of cost saving because again, as I mentioned before, the EC2 cost, the EC2 server that we were running, most of it is just going to waste. And with Lambda, you only pay when your code actually runs. So in terms of the amount of money we're spending, it's far more efficient when we only pay for our code when they actually run and do something. But more importantly for me though, as a team, is that we went from doing deployment to production maybe four to six times a month, to easily averaging about 80 to 100 deployments to production every month with the same size team. So we didn't have to hire lots of developers to go faster, but we just allow every single developer and to be more productive. And sometimes uh, features were discussed with the product team, implemented, tested, and deployed all within the same day. In terms of how do you actually build a production-ready service application, I actually put together a whole video course for Manning, which you can find the link here. The slides will be available later, so you can go check it out afterwards. And for this talk, I want to talk about some of the things that we did uh, with uh, serverless technologies, how we're able to revolutionize the platform very, very quickly. But the first and probably the most important step that we actually took was to make sure that our legacy monolithic system is publishing events for every single state change into a Kinesis stream, or in this case, it's actually several different streams, so that we can compose different features together using events, which is a great way for building loosely coupled a system in a loosely coupled way, and that Lambda become the glue that helps us connect all these different parts together. So in this case, you have your Kinesis stream or your event stream, and then you have all your microservices. Many of them may be written with API Gateway and Lambda, and whenever they do something interesting, like changing the state for a user, they will publish an event into the stream to say, hey, we've just changed the user's profile. And then other systems can then respond to those events using Lambda functions. They can all do their own thing. Some microsystems, uh, microservices uh, may be taking a copy of the data they need and put it into its own DynamoDB table so that when they're at runtime, someone asks for the data, they don't have to go back to the other microservice and therefore creating potential for cascade failures. Or they may be sending a, a real-time update to a customer by IoT call messaging, uh, message hub. And when these other microservices have state changes, they also then publish those state changes back to the stream as events so that other systems can react to them and do their own thing as well. So this is, is a, I think this is a great way for building loosely coupled systems together through events, whereby you have your bounded contacts around every single microservices and instead of having them talk to each other directly and cross that bounded contacts, instead they will all be publishing events independently to a stream and they can all react to those events independently as well. So that, as we saw in the previous talk, allows you to build more, more robust systems, more resilient systems and more scalable systems as well. And this, of course, is not a new idea. It's been around for many, many years. Uh, databases have got this idea called a transaction log. And in the world of distributed systems, uh, you also have this idea called the unified log processing and so on. But however, this is my favorite way, or I guess my preferred way of building systems nowadays, but I still find that it's not super bullet by any means. 
For starters, you have all these services that are publishing events to some stream, and they're all consuming events from the stream as well. So what do you do when you need to update one of the events that one of your services is publishing? How do you make sure that you don't accidentally break other systems that depends on your events? And this is where some of the things we talked about that we heard in the last talk in terms of documentation, in terms of using contract and testing, using something like Async API, which um, uh, Franz just mentioned this morning that has got a new version that has just been published called Async API 2.0. Another mistake I, find, I often find is that within your same bounded contact, within the scope of one microservices, oftentimes I see people use events to drive and orchestrate workflows. And this is what I find, often I find problematic because you end up in, inviting a lot of unnecessary complexity in terms of how you log and trace and debug things. And this is especially troublesome when, for example, I can't even do simple things like putting a timeout on the entire workflow because the workflow itself doesn't exist as a standalone concept anywhere in my application. It only exists as a logical sum of loosely connected parts. So it becomes very difficult for me to do kind of end-to-end -end reporting for the workflow itself without building lots of extra layers on top of it. So when it comes to implementing orchestrating workflows, especially within the same bounded context, I still prefer to use a workflow engine such as Amazon Step Functions. But anytime I make any state changes within my workflow, maybe adding a new credit card number to user profile, I will still publish them as events back to the stream so that other systems can again react to them independently. So in terms of how we transition from this monolithic system to this uh, uh, service application architecture with lots of events, a lot of lambda functions, uh, we didn't do one big bang, which would be horrendous. Instead, we apply what you would call a strangler pattern, whereby we chip away at our, mi our monolith one piece at a time, and then we move them into microservices with lambda functions and streams and events and so on. And one of the rules that we had was that we didn't want to do rewrite for the sake of rewrite, so we would only typically touch one domain when we need to create new, add new features or we need to improve performance or scalability and so on. And that's when we look at that particular domain and see, okay, does it fit with the constraints that we have with Lambda before we decide to move it to serverless? And one of the first domains that we targeted was something that's not so critical, so it's also not so risky if things did go wrong, whereby we had a search feature in the app, which at the time was built using regex queries against the MongoDB, which as you can imagine just didn't scale well at all. In fact, we were running into all kinds of performance issues when we only had about 100 or 200,000 users, which is nothing compared to where we actually aspire to be as a company to have millions and tens of millions of users. So one of the first things we did, since we already have the, stream, the state changes from the monolith going to Kinesis stream, is that we then attach a Lambda function to this stream to react to whenever user has been created or user has updated their profile to then use that event to update a user index in Amazon's cloud search so that we can build an API in front of that using API Gateway and Lambda to allow you to search user by first name, last name, and username and so on. And we were able to implement a kind of you know, fussy search as well as custom ranking so that users who are more prominent in the platform, have more followers and so on, would return high up in the search results. In this case, uh, before, uh, we don't want to wait for the mobile teams and other teams to catch up to use our new API, so we will also proxy the legacy system so that the, M the legacy endpoints would call our new API and return, value return instead so that we can deliver value to our customers straight away. Another thing we didn't have at the time was a BI pipeline, so we went about building one from scratch. At the time, we were using a platform called the Mixed Panel, and for some Strange reason, we were paying for the top tier contract they had, which is about $3,000 a month, even though we don't have much data at all. And the one of the worst problems that we found with Mixed Panel is that it's great for generic mobile and app events, like someone logging in and so on, but it doesn't, it doesn't understand our domain. We can't ask questions about our social graph and say, please only find me users that logged in, say, in the last 24 hours who follows us this, kind of, this couple of users because uh, they may be interested in, in music. So we just have a um, tiny temper join the platform. Maybe we should wanna, we wanna target those users and try to find who the users are. We couldn't do that with Mixpanel. So we went about 
streaming all the events that we already have in the street, in the Kinesis stream, to Google BigQuery, which is a service that can use from GCP for doing ad hoc queries against exabyte size data sets and still get answers back within a few seconds. So in this case, uh, we were able to stream all the state changes in the system to Google BigQuery, and our BI guy can, run, can just write the plain SQL-like query against BigQuery and find all kinds of interesting questions, answers about what the users are doing in our platform. And this work took many iterations. The first iteration took one developer just two days from initial discussion to running something in production. And our BI analyst just joined us recently, uh, actually came to us afterwards and said, uh, Jesus, guys, nothing ever got done this fast at Skype, where he just came from, which is, of course, no disrespect to Skype. But this all goes back to the point I was trying to make earlier, that the lead time to someone saying thank you for the work that you've done, for the value that you're adding, is the one thing that's most important to us, and that's what we should all be optimized ourselves towards. So another thing that we found was that as we move from using Mixpanel to Google BigQuery, because Google BigQuery, you only pay for the amount of data processing that you actually do, so we end up, based on, based on the amount of data that we had, we were paying something like three cents a month for Google BigQuery for the same amount of work, in fact, more, uh, more work, because there's all kinds of things we couldn't do Mixpanel compared to the $3,000 a month that we were paying before for the same, well, we essentially try to get us less capabilities. Uh, so since those days, uh, Amazon also published, created its own service uh, to compete with Google BigQuery called Athena. So in the nowadays, uh, what I would do is, if I would do this again is I would still use Kinesis as my sync for all the events coming, uh, happening in the system. And then I would use a Firehose where I can connect it to a Kinesis stream and then have it batch and write data into files and put them into S3. And from there, I can then have AWS Glue to scan the data in the S3 bucket, work out a schema, and then make them available as tables that I can query in Amazon Athena. And from there, I can also then create BI dashboards by hooking up different widgets as to different query that you can run in Amazon Athena. All of this is great in that I don't have to write any custom code, Fireholes, does all the batching, all of that stuff for me out of the box. And, and again, Glue just scans the data you have in S3 for you without me having to write any custom code. And the same with uh, QuickSign and Athena. And also, for all these components that you see here, they're all pay per use. So I only pay for them when things are actually happening, and I don't pay for them at all when there's nothing, you know, there's no events going through the system, including when no one's looking at the dashboard in QuickSight. So this allows me to turn user actions, track them, and turn them into business insight very, very easily with just a few lines of uh, CloudFormation metric. And then uh, we also, as we get more comfortable with writing Lambda functions, testing them, and running them, and, and monitoring them in production, we started to move towards a more critical part of the system. Like other social networks, we have a timeline feature whereby you can see the posts from all the people that you follow. The problem that we have with our implementation was that, uh, well, it just didn't quite work. Uh, at least not in the way that it was intended. And also, in, it was also really over-engineered to the point that no one could really debug it. Uh, how over-engineered, you ask, uh, you, for the whole thing to work, you have to have all these uh, JavaScript module files named 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. They have to be in that particular order with that particular naming for them to work. Um, so good luck trying to figure out whenever something doesn't quite do what you think it's going to do. In fact, the system was so hard to debug and, and, and work with, the people, the team that developed it couldn't debug it. So around the same time, a new CTO had come in, realized that the whole thing also just didn't scale. So um, while well, he did what... <laughs> He did what maybe a sensible CTO would do in a situation like this and just fired most of the team. At that point, I came in, a few other people that he's worked with in the past also joined the team later. And we went about building the system from scratch again by first talking to the product team to actually understand what is the vision for this feature, you know, what are, how is this actually supposed to work. And then we went about rebuilding it from scratch by building on top of the events that we already have. The events that are already coming from a legacy API system and published into Kinesis streams. So in this case, whenever I create a new post, an event will be recorded in the Kinesis and that will trigger a Lambda function who will then go to some API to find out who all my followers are and then batch them in groups of say a thousand and for every batch, publish a message to SNS which can then trigger another Lambda function. 
who would then take my post ID and then add it to my followers feed, which are stored as sorted set in Redis. And the reason that we go to SNS here rather than a direct Lambda to Lambda invocation is that you get built-in retry and the delta queue support when you, go when you invoke Lambda functions through SNS. And uh, when you design this kind of system, you want to optimize towards the worst case performance. Because like every other social network, 90% of your users will have maybe two or three followers, but that's gonna be that five to 10% that's gonna have 100,000, a million followers. And what you don't wanna happen is when the things go wrong, you have to retry that operation, the expensive part of the operation, which is fetching a, a million records from the database for all the people that's following, I don't know, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo or, or someone like that. So in this case, this allows us to, to retry and, and uh, at the sort of spatch level, which is much smaller. And once we have the data, there you go, avoid repeating the expensive work of fetching lots and lots of data from the relationship table. In this case, once we have the data in Redis, we can also then build an API in front of that to allow you to search for users by, uh, um, sorry, uh, to fetch your timeline. In this case, uh, we did the same strategy that we used before in terms of uh, also proxying the legacy endpoint to call our new API so that we can deliver value to our uh, improvement to our customers earlier without having to wait for the mobile and the web team to catch up and start using our new API. And once we know that all the clients are now using the latest, the new API directly, then we can then also de um, deprecate the, the old legacy endpoints. In this case, we've got a bunch of different Lambda functions that have to all work together. Some are doing background processing, some are serving API requests, but it doesn't matter. They all have to work together to service this feature. So I will put everything into one repo, and I'll make sure that uh, that service name matches uh, what, um, uh, what some feature tag and all that, so that I can find them easily. And the last thing I want to talk about is that uh, we also have this other feature, like other social network, where we recommend you user that you should follow. Um, Problem is, uh, the feature also just didn't work, at least not in any sensible way, because when I look into the code, what it was doing was returning the, f the first 30 users from the database by account creation time as a recommendation for these are the people you should follow. Uh, which, when you think about it as a recommendation system, it kind of just doesn't make any sense uh, whatsoever. So, we went about improving this system by building it again using events and so on. In this case, because we have all the state changes happening and recorded in Google BigQuery already, so what I can do is I have a set up, I set up a cron job in CloudWatch events to call a Lambda function once every hour, which would then run a, uh, a query against Google BigQuery to find out how many user interactions have happened in terms of people following each other, people liking each other's content, and then the, apply a time decay formula so that if someone followed you in the last hour, that gives you a higher score than if someone followed you, say, uh, uh, say 24 hours ago, and use that to work out who are the current people that are trending the platform, put them into a Dynamic DB table, and expose that as API that you can call to find out who are the trending users on the platform right now. And any time you follow someone or unfollow someone, those relationship changes are also captured and processed and stored in a social graph inside a graph database, which at the time I was using GraphineDB, which is a hosted version of Neo4j a graph database, which makes it really easy for me to run the kind of uh, second degree or third degree queries to say, find me all the people that follow the people that follow me and so on. In this case, I can also, I also update the legacy systems endpoint, the recommendation endpoint to say, instead of returning the first 30 people from the database, instead we make the call to these two new APIs, and then we will randomize the results and uh, hydrate them and so on, and return them to the caller. So that I was able to deliver a lot of value and improve the whole system's recommendation just in one day's work. Pretty much the whole thing was built by myself in one day. So as we transition from this uh, monolithic system running on EC2 to a serverless, application, a serverless architecture with lots of events and very much event driven, and one of the things we find is that our system became more scalable and scales up a lot faster as well because we get that as the platform, uh, from the platform out of the box. And also, the system is much cheaper because we don't pay for idle time when our function is not running, it's not doing anything, we don't pay for them. 
And we also find that our system became more resilient just because AWS deploys Lambda function to three availability zones out of the box, so we don't have to pay for the actual redundancy, but we get them for free anyway. This also became more secure because now Amazon is looking after the security of the operating system itself and the network configurations. And we get all these nice DevOps side of things out of the box in terms of having blue-green deployment, multi-AZ, auto-scaling, and so on, so that I can focus on the things that I can deliver and the things that only I can do for my customers and have this great velocity between having an idea and having something that actually runs in production. So that in terms of why, we were able to deliver better user experience, to deliver value to our users faster, and to also, at the same time, be more cost-efficient, more scalable, and more resilient all at the same time. So that's my talk, and if you want to get in touch with me and ask me questions, uh, here are all the different ways you can follow me. I'll publish slides on the slide share after this, and I'll tweet it to the Twitter handle. Thank you. Thank you, Yan. Do we have some questions from the audience? There was a lot of information, right? Oh, we have, oh, we have two. Wow. <laughs> Hi. Oh, yeah. Hello. So nice presentation. I really liked it. Uh, one question I have is uh, by using uh, the services from the AWS, like Lambda, Canonsys, and other, don't you think you become too dependent on the service provider? Let's say in future you want to move to Azure or Google Cloud or some other service provider. How is that possible? How would it be possible? Sure. Um, I don't think using Lambda itself is much of a login because writing my code differently for different Lambda, uh, other, say, Google Cloud function, whatnot, is just changing the signature. But it's using all the different managed services from AWS. That's where you may think, okay, right, if I want to move uh, all my system uh, to Google Cloud, it's going to take work. But regardless of what you do, it's going to take work anyway. Either you do them ahead of time and put in loads of abstractions and whatnot so that you don't have to, you have to reduce, they reduce the amount of rewrite you have to do later. But either way, you can either do the work upfront when you don't know whether or not how likely you're even going to move in later on. And besides, in terms of uh, for startups, you have 100 different problems. Portability is probably your, your 101st. So all these are problems that you're going to have, if they're more important than having portability to move to Google Cloud at a whim tomorrow, then optimize for those instead. You can, you, there's all kinds of things you can do to actually make it easier in terms of using Hasagon architectures to write your code you know, separate from the way they integrate your Lambda and all of that. But again, those are all complexity that you end up investing upfront rather than deal with them when it actually becomes a problem. And we learned the same lesson with ORMs years ago that you're supposed to solve uh, database migration problems magically, but that wasn't the case. 99% of the time, we don't ever migrate our database. And 1% of the time that we do have to migrate, we still end up doing lots of work anyway, just because um, the ORMs, uh, the ORMs just didn't do, I think I'm getting kicked off the stage, the ORMs just didn't do what the client promised. Uh, I think you have the same thing in terms of uh, building abstraction up front to make a portability easier later. Having to check more about that later, but I'm sorry, I, I stopped. Next it's okay, guy. it's okay. Next speaker, please. <laughs> oh, we still have time. Oh, okay. Yeah, there is one more question. Okay, in that it's case. Okay, uh, yeah? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. It was really interesting. Uh, your architecture design by how it's designed is always with con um, eventual consistency. So at some point, the data is going to be stored. So did you have any case when you need, for example, I mean, in the feed, you need at the same time you post something that should be there at the moment, it's synchronously with, do you have that problem? Uh, we did have one time that had a, that had a problem, uh, which is when someone signs up, uh, we actually populate their initial, we give them an initial set of uh, posts in, on our timeline, uh, but if you just all everything is asynchronously by events, uh, we find that sometimes people will sign up and then they come into the app, but that background job hasn't done yet, because you know, the, so they come into the app with empty, no, no, no post. So that's one, one of the few places where we do say, okay, we can't do this asynchronously. We have to do them synchronously and just wait for that post to be uh, your timeline to be populated with the initial set of uh, posts before we actually return to you, so that you move on to the registration process. Um, there's very few places where we actually have that. In general, we just assume that eventual consistency everywhere and just uh, build our system around that and deal with that. It's not always easy, but uh, yeah, it's unfortunately you just have to choose between you know, availability and sometimes uh, having that consistency. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much. <laughs>